good morning, and welcome to Victory Online from Victory Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us this morning. Trust that you're all having a very good, productive week, getting to spend some good family time together. I would like for you today, we have been talking about a particular verse of Scripture in several of our messages for the last several weeks, and I actually, I've just kind of alluded to it. I want to actually start off there today, and I believe we can uh, see this in a little different light today that I believe will be able to help you. So I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. Here we have the Apostle Paul writing, and he says, For all the promises of God in Him, that's Jesus, are yes and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. One of the things I want to bring to your attention here that the Apostle Paul is pointing out is this, that in Jesus, because we're in Christ, that the promises that God has made, and he's talking in particular about the Old Testament, uh, the, the promises that were made under the law, before the law, the Abrahamic covenant, all of those promises in Christ are yes and amen. Now, again, we looked several weeks earlier over in Galatians chapter 3 that tells us that, uh, if, that, that we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. And that if we are in Christ, then are we Abraham's seed and heirs according to that promise. So it, it, talks to, it tells us that in Christ we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Now there is, there is some misunderstanding when people look into the Old Testament. I want to remind you that in the book of Hebrews, the Bible tells us that the Old Testament to us as Christians, is we can get great examples there. That it, it gives us examples of types and shadows. It points to Jesus. The Old Testament points to the New Testament. And, and, and it gives us some insight where the New Testament is concerned. But one of the things that you have to understand is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And when you go into the New Testament and look at some stories, it looks like that God's nature, God gets mad at everybody and smites them and kills them and wipes them off the place of the earth. And, you know, if, if you give somebody a Bible, they've just gotten saved, and you give them a Bible, and they start reading their Bible, and they start in the book of Genesis chapter 1, which is what we do when we read a book. If you give somebody a book, they're going to start at the very beginning. So you give them a Bible, they start in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that's a wonderful thing. And it goes through creation. And then you figure out by chapter 6 that God wants everybody dead and wiped off the planet. So that doesn't, uh, you know, so we kind of get a little misunderstanding about what's going on here in, in God's nature. One of the reasons that we do that is because, I mentioned to you, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. However, he, he hasn't changed, however, his relationship with man has changed. You have to understand the relationship that man had with God, with God in the Old Testament is a different relationship than we have with Him in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we are able to be born again. We are provided eternal life and the very life of God that abides on the inside of us. That wasn't true in the Old Testament. Now, there were people that, that were able to walk in righteousness, but they were able to walk in righteousness to the obedience of God, and in particular obedience to the law where that's concerned. But in the New Testament, through the blood of the Lord Jesus, we're able to experience the new birth and to have the Spirit of the, very, of the living God live on, on the inside of us. So although He hasn't changed, His relationship with us has changed, and our revelation of His nature has changed. And one of the things that uh, has happened that's revealed that to us is the coming of the Lord Jesus to the earth. If you'll recall in Jesus' ministry, one of the things that Jesus told us, He said, the things that I do are the things that I see my Father do, and the things that I say are the things that I hear my Father say. So what we find in the Gospel accounts, we find Jesus revealing to us the nature of the Father. And you know, one of the things that you find when you're looking through the gospel accounts is God isn't just waiting around for us to mess up so He can swat us over the head with a baseball bat. One of the things that you find in the four gospel accounts is when people are in need, God is moved with compassion to meet that need. You don't find people coming up to Jesus with need and Him going, no, 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 I'm sorry, you have to continue on through this trial and tribulation because the Father is trying to perfect some things in you 
and you will do a whole lot better by going through this, and you will come out better on the other side. So I want to look at some things this morning. By the way, Jesus did not say that, okay? When people came to Jesus for help, the thing that he offered to them out of compassion was he offered them deliverance. Now that's the covenant that we have with God today. So I want to, uh, we can get some insight. We can uh, get some better understanding by actually looking in the Old Testament at some things. And here, again, the Apostle Paul says that in Christ, all the promises of God are yes and amen. Now, I want to look this morning at the different names of God. Because one of the things that we find in the different names of God, we find revealed in those different names His nature, His character. We even find provided in those names promises that are in His name. I want to remind you, and I want you to keep this in mind as we're going through this this morning, that God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I want you to go ahead. We're going to be getting here in just a few minutes, so you might as well go ahead and and turn here to um, uh, Psalm 119. I want you to have that open in your Bible, uh, because here in just a moment there's something that I want you to look at. Do you remember when Moses... uh, was in Egypt, and he, uh, he left Egypt when he was about 40 years old. He goes out into the wilderness. He's out in the wilderness for 40 years, so that means he's what? Yeah, he's right at 80 years old. He's out in the wilderness, and the Lord appears to him. The Lord appears to him in a burning bush, first of all. He reveals himself to Moses, and he gives Moses uh, a charge. He gives Moses an opportunity. He gives him an assignment, and that assignment is that he has heard his children crying out in the land of Goshen in Egypt for deliverance. So the Lord appears to Moses and tells him, I want you to go and deliver my people. And Moses comes up with all kinds of reasons why he can't do that. He comes up with all kinds of reasons of why he's not worthy, why he's not adequate. He comes up with all kinds of reasons why he doesn't need to go do this. But God convinces him he needs to go do it. And, and so one of the things that Moses asked God, he said, now when I go in there, because remember the Egyptians had a lot of different gods. So Moses says, now when I go in there, they're going to want to know what God it is that sent me. So who is it? What name do I use to tell them that God has sent me to deliver his people? And the Lord told him, he said, you tell Pharaoh that I am that I am sent you. Now, when we look at that word, that, that there is so much in that word. There are so many names, different names of God, that are used just in that phrase. Uh, it, it's the phrase Jehovah Elohim, Elohike, Elohe, and Elohim are all combined in that particular name. Now, we have shortened it to say, uh, I am, or, or the God that's I am sent you. We, we have shortened it to that. Now, one of the things that I want to, uh, to share with you, there is something that you may be familiar with called the Tetragrammaton. Now, the Tetragrammaton is the, are the symbols, actually the Hebrew letters of the name of God. It, it's, we say it Yahweh, but it's actually four letters. And in English, those letters are Y-H-W-H, and we call that the Tetragrammaton. Now, the Tetragrammaton is one of the seven names of God that are so holy that once these names are written, they can never be erased. Uh, the Tetragrammaton, the Y-H-W-H is one of them. El, E-L is another one. Elohim is another one. Eloah, Eloi, or El Shaddai, and Zavoet are the other names that once they're written, they're so holy they cannot be erased. So those give us insight into the character of God, the, the, the different um, uh, attributes that God has seen. Because it's difficult to describe who God is. And it was difficult, it's difficult for us now, it was difficult for people back in the Old Testament to describe who God was. And there are times that God would appear to people and He would use a particular name to help identify Himself to them, And there's also times that there are people in the Old Testament because of what God did for them 
they name him something. So we find man giving him these names, and we find God uh, actually referring to himself by these names. Now, something very interesting, and the reason that I've got you here in, in Psalm 119 is this. Uh, Psalm 119, I don't know if you knew this or not, but Psalm 119 is an acrostic. And it, it is an acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. And in this particular psalm, there are 22 um, stanzas, if you will, and they're eight verses long. So that means 22 times 8 is 176. So there's 176 verses in the 150th psalm. Let me, let me flip over here real quick and verify that. Yep, that's what it says in my Bible. So... Psalm 119, this is the way that uh, oftentimes the Hebrew children are taught the alphabet, is by using the 119th Psalm. And so you find that it is, as I said, it's an acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet. And in some of your Bibles, uh, I know it is in mine, at the beginning of each stanza, you find the Hebrew alphabet. Now, the Hebrew alphabet is, is amazing to, to understand some things about the different letters because in the Hebrew alphabet, unlike our alphabet, uh, the Hebrew alphabet, each letter means something. The letter itself means something, and it also has a numerical value. Uh, the first letter that we have here is right before verse 1. It's the word aleph. Well, aleph and bet is the second uh, letter, that's where we get our word alphabet from. So Aleph, we find here in, uh, at the beginning of this, and then you have the next eight verses that describe this. Then you find at the beginning of verse 9 the word bet. Uh, the word, it's spelled Beth, but it's pronounced bet. Uh, for instance, the word bet means house or tent. Well, do you remember just a few moments ago I, I shared to you the uh, seven names of God and one of those names is El. So when you see in your Bible the place called Beth El, Beth means house. El is a name of God, so house of God or house of the Lord is what Beth El means. And so you get all kinds of insight into things like this. Now one of the things that is so interesting about this is the Tetragrammaton, which is the Y-H-W-H, the name of God. We say it Yahweh. Now, the word Yahweh and the word Jehovah are the same thing. Jehovah is the medieval Latin translation of the word Yahweh. And by, by Latin medieval, some people believe it actually has Germanic origin. And so instead of the Y, you have the J, and then you have the H and the H, and instead of the W, you have the V. So you just replace the Y and the W with the J and the V. And then what's interesting, we just kind of think that randomly vowels were put in there, but the, the, they weren't put in there randomly. They were actually the vowels that were used from the word Adonai. Adonai is another name for the word, or it's another name of God. It means the Lord. And so the A and the O and the A are inserted in Yahweh or, or transliterated to make Jehovah. So when you hear somebody say Jehovah or you hear somebody say Yahweh, it's referring to the same, to the same names, the same name. Now here in your Psalm 119, you're still there, right? So here in Psalm 119, I want to show you something. The, now remember, Hebrew is written from right to left. So the, the Y in Hebrew, if you will look over, let me see here, uh, in, in front of verse 73, at the beginning of verse 73, you will see the letter Yod. Now, Yod to us, it looks like an apostrophe. So it's just, it, it's the same word, remember the New Testament translated in Greek, it's not Hebrew. Remember, Jesus said, to, when talking about the law, he said, every jot and every tittle. Well, the word jot that he used is the word yod. It's the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So that's yod, and the next letter would be he, or h to us. And that's at the beginning of verse 33. You can look in your Bible. There it is, right there. Uh, it looks kind of like a, I don't know, maybe a lowercase n, but and it's got a little opening up there at the, at the upper left-hand corner. Uh, and then right below that in verse 
41, right above that, is the letter Vav. Now, in some of your Bibles, you will see this as V-A-V. In others, you will see it V-A-U. And others have it as W-A-W. But it's the letter Vav. Now, the thing that is so interesting about this to me is, so you have the Yod, the He, the Vav, and the He. Do you remember I told you that each letter has a meaning of its own? Well, you know, when you look at the word Yod there at the beginning of verse 73, the word Yod means hand. And the letter He means behold or to look. The letter Vav means nail. So when you look at the word, what we say is Yahweh, the literal meaning of that word is behold the hand, behold the nail. Now isn't that awesome? God, when He was talking to Moses, when He, when he revealed His name to him, actually prophesied to him the way that He would redeem mankind. I just think that's neat to, to look at that. So, uh, we want to look this morning at the different names of God. And Did you know, I don't know if you were aware of this or not, but there are 16, some, some people call it uh, the, the Jehovah names, some people call it the hyphenated names, uh, but there are 16 titles of Jehovah that are used. In our, now, there's other names. Remember, I, I gave you seven other names of which Jehovah was one of those, the Tetragrammaton was one of those. But now that we're going to take that, we're going to take the name Jehovah, the Lord, and we're going to look at the hyphenated names that we find throughout the Old Testament. Now, we're not going to be able to, we're not going to have enough time to go through all of those today. But I want to kind of get started and introduce this uh, for us today, and we'll continue with this probably for a few weeks here. So, uh, one of the things that you notice, I, 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 want you to, I want you to look with me in Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, and I believe that's about verse 7, let me look here and see. Exodus 20 and verse 7, yes. This is where Moses, uh, this is where we have the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are found in, in chapter 20. Now listen, one of the things about the, the Ten Commandments that you're going to think is really interesting is this. And that is that, and, and you can go back to chapter 19 and read this and then read on through the next few chapters and you'll, you'll, you'll see the whole story. We just go to chapter 20 and talk about the ten, when the Ten Commandments were given, written in stone. Here they are. Okay, actually, there were more than ten laws that were given. There were 613 laws that were given. There were not just ten. There, there were more than that. So, but what I want to look at is this. That morning... The Lord had told Moses, he said, I want you to prepare the people to meet me. Now, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be awesome? Can you imagine you have just been in bondage for over 400 years in Egypt? The Lord has delivered you by a strong, mighty hand out of the land of Egypt. You have left with gold and silver. You go back and read that. The Bible says that the Lord instructed the, the children of Israel to go to the Egyptians and to demand of them gold and silver. So, they, and they did. They went to them, and, 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 the, and they were glad to give it up because they wanted them to leave because all kinds of bad stuff was happening. So, they go and they get the gold and the silver. They go out, and then we have the Red Sea. We have, we have, uh, 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 the, the, uh, uh, we have water being provided for them. We have, I mean, all kinds of things. So, that, here they are at Mount Sinai. And so, they're out here, and God's going to reveal himself to the nation of Israel. He's going to reveal Himself to the whole nation, not just Moses, the whole nation. And so the Lord gives Moses instruction. He said, I want you to tell the people to prepare themselves because in three days from now, we're going to meet. Now you would think, I mean, think about you for just a moment. Wouldn't you, how many times have you thought, if Jesus could just be here right now and just talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I would feel so much better. I know that this would work. I know that I would be delivered from this. I know that I would get relief from this. This, this is what's being offered to the whole nation of Israel. God is going to come and meet with them. God is going to come and talk with them. Now, listen, what God's intent was. Remember, the, the nation of Israel, God's plan, He tells you what His plan is. His plan is for the whole nation of Israel to be a holy nation, 
and a royal priesthood to the world. That's what his plan is. When they come out of Egypt, that's God's design, that's God's plan. Well, how come that didn't happen? I thought that all the plans of God came to pass. No. Just because God has a plan for somebody doesn't mean necessarily that plan. As a matter of fact, God has a plan for each one of you. God has a plan, the Bible tells us, is to give you a hope in the future. Uh, the Bible tells us that it's a plan to prosper you. The Bible tells that God has good things for you. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father lights in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. God desires good things for you. But it doesn't mean that it just automatically happens. He has to have your cooperation where that is concerned. And, it's, and, and to fulfill that vision, it's going to take you walking in faith. We learned last week, where do you get faith from? You get faith from the Word, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So God has all the nation of Israel out here, and so He's going to meet with them in three days. So He gives Moses specific instructions how they're supposed to conduct themselves for the next three days. So the three days go by, they wake up the next morning, everybody's all excited, and they come out of their tents, and they look at Mount Sinai, and oh my goodness, there is smoke billowing off of Mount Sinai. There are rumblings. There is thunder on the mountain. And you would think that everybody is excited about that. But that's not what happens. The nation of Israel, they come out of their tents. They look at what's happening on the mountain. And they're not overcome with joy. They are scared. It frightens them. So, they start talking to one another. And they work themselves up into a lather. Y'all know what I mean by that, don't you? Uh, just a frenzy. And what they have convinced themselves of is this. The Lord has brought us out here to kill us. Do you remember? That's what they have been saying ever since they left Egypt. When, when they came to the Red Sea, remember? They're at the sea. They've got the sea in front of them. They've got Pharaoh's army chariots coming behind them. And they start crying out, going, oh, would to God that would have just stayed in Egypt and died. Why did you bring us out here to kill us? So it's obviously, it wasn't their faith that parted the sea. It was Moses. So, the, and they've been saying this every step of the way. Oh, God's brought us out here to kill us. Oh, and as a matter of fact, this generation says it over and over and over. The Bible says that they do it ten times, that they provoke the Lord ten times. So they're, they're not getting it. So here are this wonderful, fabulous opportunities available to them. They wake up the next morning, and they are convinced that morning with all of the smoke, with all of the rumblings, that God is going to kill them. So they get a delegation together. They get a representative of each tribe. They send that delegation to Moses. And they say, Moses, it appears that the Lord is angry. And it appears that he's angry with us. So, we think that he might kill us. So, you go up. Now, you know, you don't need very many enemies when you have friends like this. They thought God was going to kill somebody, so they volunteered Moses to go up on the mountain and talk to him. If he's going to kill anybody, might as well kill Moses. So, now, now listen to him. These people had the opportunity... For God Himself, this, this is what God desired. God desired for them, for the whole nation of Israel, for God to speak to them and tell each one of them His law, His statutes, explain things to Him. That's what God's plan was. But because of their fear, because of their doubt and unbelief, they never received that. So when Moses went up and talked to God, God said, okay, I was going to tell, I was going to put this, speak this to them in their hearts. But because they have done this, you are going to have to teach them. So then Moses was given the assignment of teaching the law to the children of Israel. Now, in one of those commandments that he gave, and remember, there were 613 of them. There were not just 10. There were 613 of them. 10 are kind of the table of contents. 10, the, the, the first 10 that are listed here, categorize things that there are commandments that pertain to God 
and their commandments that pertain to your neighbor. Now, we find that theme in, in the New Testament. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And on this hang all the law of the prophets. So he said, the, all of the law, everything is summed up in love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So that's what you find in the commandments. You find uh, laws or instructions on how to obey God, how to worship God, how to have a relationship with God, and how to have a relationship with your neighbor. Here in verse 7, it says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, for years, when we look at this, and, and, and we look at, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We look at that, we think, to us today, we think of that as cussing. When somebody cusses, we think that that's, what, that's violating this verse of Scripture. That's not what he's talking about. There are 16 different names of God, hyphenated names of God, that give us different characteristics of Him. Uh, one of them is uh, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh is the Lord my provider. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord our shepherd. So you find these, these different expressions of God, that's what this is talking about. When you see the name Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord our provider, if we make the expression, well, you know, I don't know why God just didn't provide this for me, that's taking His name in vain. Remember, I told you, to, I wanted you to, rem, I'm reminding you to remember something through this teaching this morning, and that is God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is not schizophrenic. God is not a healer one day and one that puts sickness, disease on you the next day. It would violate His nature. His nature is that of a healer. His nature is that of a provider. His nature is that of being a shepherd. So we have these things that are revealed here. Now, I want to share with you one thing here in closing. And again, we're going to pick this on up and go into more detail uh, here in the coming weeks. But I want you to turn with me. This, this will help you. Uh, this is another thing that, that will give you some insight into a particular verse of Scripture over in Psalms chapter 8 and verse 5. Now, I have to, you, you have to watch this because it's possible that this might, uh, this might mess your doctrine up just a little bit here. But this gives us insight as we're talking about this morning where the names of God are concerned. In Psalm chapter 8 and verse 5, He's, he's begun talking about, this is a psalm of David, and David is wondering one day, who is man that you're even mindful of him, Lord? I mean, who are we that you would even think about us? And so that's, he's just thinking about these things. And another powerful thing in this verse is verse 2, out of the mouth of babes and, and sucklings, you have ordained strength. That's, that's a really good thing. Okay, verse 5. So he's, he's, go back to verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. So we have in our thinking, because of this particular passage of Scripture, that somehow you, you hear people talk about when somebody passes away on the earth here, that now the Lord has another angel in heaven. And they've just become an angel. And, and the reason that the Lord took so and so is because he needed another angel in heaven. I want to draw something to your attention here in this particular verse of Scripture. Remember we were talking about the names of God? The word for angels here is mistranslated. The word angels here is the Hebrew word Elohim. Now, the word Elohim means the eternal creator. That is, the, the, uh, it's actually a plural name for God that means the creator. You find it in Genesis chapter 2. Remember when, let us make man in our image 
That's the plural form of God. So literally, this verse of Scripture in Psalm 8, verse 5, for you have, he's talking about man, you have made man a little lower than God. Remember that you are made in God's class and in His image. Angels are not made in God's image. The Bible tells us very clearly uh, in the book of Psalms and over also in the book of Hebrews that angels are our servants. They excel in strength, hearkening unto the voice of the Word of God. They are sent forth to help us, those of us that are heirs to salvation. They're mighty powerful creatures that God has designed that are our helpers. But this is a particular verse here that kind of gives you insight by knowing the names of God. This particular verse here gives you insight. Now we're going to look next week, uh, uh, we're going to look at David and Goliath and about how one of the particular names that God calls on there is one of the things that helps David get victory. And we're going to spend that. We're going to look at, at Abraham and Isaac. That's another great story that has one of these names revealed to us that gives us insight into that story. So we'd like thank you for joining us this morning. And we'd like to encourage you to join us also next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock Easter time. Hope you have a wonderful, blessed week. And may God's richest and very best be yours.